Okay, this morning I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 7. I do want to remind you that we have the Lord's table also this morning, so be preparing your hearts for that. Matthew chapter 7. Last uh, time in 1 Peter, I kind of ended on prayer, and I wanted to kind of continue uh, to look at that from another place in Scripture. And this morning, I want to look at the, really the persistence in what God wants you for you in your life, the persistence in what God wants for you. Now, our Lord encourages us to pray and ask God for things. If you look at verse number 7 and 8, it says, Ask, and it will be given you, Matthew 7, verse 7, Seek and you will find, knock and it will be open to you. Verse 8 says, For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him, to him who knocks it will be open. Now someone may say, I've tried that, and it doesn't work, I don't buy it. Now for the sake of that person, and for all of us who would like to be encouraged in our praying, let's look at what Jesus continues to say in verse number 9. It says, Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a snake? Will he? Or if he asks for a fish, will he will give him a snake, will he? If then, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? So in these verses, Jesus is telling us to ask, and if the thing is good, God will give it to you. So to, in order to be encouraged this morning in our praying, let's see who this is a promise to and what it is a promise of. But before I do go any further, let's pray. Lord, this morning I do ask you, Lord, as your disciples came to you and asked you, Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, we're asking the same thing to you this morning. We're asking you, Lord, in this part of our Christian walk to teach us how to really pray to know how to pray, to know what to ask for. And I pray, Lord, as we wrestle through these issues in regard to our prayer life, I pray, Lord, each month and each year our prayers would become more in line with Scripture in what you intended. And I pray, Lord, as we learn to pray, that we would pray anticipating answers according to your will. And I pray this this morning in Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to ask the first question, and the first question is this, is, the, is this, what, uh, this is a promise for genuine children who are trying to please the Father. This is a promise for genuine children who are trying to pr please the Father. So the promise is for those who are genuine children of God. If you notice in our verses, it says in verse number 9, when his son asks. And then in verse number 10, it says, know how to give good gifts to your children. All right, so this is in the context of a father, a parent to their children. And in this case, we're talking about children who do know their father because they have come to Christ. Remember, this passage sits in the sermon that preached, Christ preached on the Sermon on the Mount. So he's preached there what genuine believers ought to be, and he describes them in those chapters uh, when he preaches the Sermon on the Mount. So those who have come to the Heavenly Father by his appointed means, that is, through Jesus Christ, and now they come in humble prayer as it says in Matthew 5, 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. 
for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Of course, poverty of spirit is a general confession of a person that needs God and know they need God. A translation of that could be, blessed is the man who realizes his own utter helplessness before God and his need for him and puts his whole trust in him. That's where we really learn to pray. So no unregenerate, unsaved person can lay claim to the promise in this text. This is only to God's children. Also, this promise is for those children who are trying to please the Father, those who are persistent in their prayers. The promise is really attached to a direct, to really direct commands, and those direct commands are this, ask, seek, and knock. These are three imperatives which bring to us a continuing persistence that we are to actually use in our Christian walk. And though that persistence really sounds like this. Keep on asking, keep on seeking, and keep on knocking. So the promises for those who are persistent in their prayers, prayer that is characterized by a burning pursuit for God, and the good things he gives his children. Now, we have to ask the question to ourselves, are we as holy as we ought to be? Are we as meek and as loving and as pure, as obedient to God that we, we should be and would like to be? The answer would have to be from all of us, no, we're not yet. We're heading in that direction. Well, see, you need to be asking the Heavenly Father that these virtues may be multiplied in your life and that you and I need a hunger, a new hunger actually every day for prayer because this is the very area that probably Satan is going to uh, really challenge us the most in or come against us in is that we are, uh, is our prayer life. Uh, How is our prayer life? Are we growing in our prayer life? Are we asking for the Lord, for the right things? Do we even know what to ask the Lord when it comes to prayer? See, all these things come to our mind when we think of that. So that is who the promise is to. It's to God's children, nobody else. But what is the promise of? What is the promise of? Well, the answer to that is this. The promise is uh, God is more ready to give good gifts to his children than we parents are to give good gifts to our children. Now, we parents do give good gifts to our children, don't we? All right? Actually, when it comes to birthdays, what do we try to do? We try to, through the time, the year, we kind of know what they want, right? We, we, We try to give them what they may want. Right? We do that. That's what we do as parents. When it comes to Christmas time, maybe we overdo it. All right? They get more gifts than they should get. Right? And so we are looking at our children, understanding what they like and don't like, and we are trying to give them good things. That's what we do as, as parents. We want to give our kids good things. Not bad things, good things. Now, we do this despite being evil and having human limitations. Now, if you look at our passage in Matthew 7, verse number 9, it says something very specific in this passage. It says this, if you then, being evil, now, of course, why does it say that we are evil? Because as compared to God, We're evil, and of course, the passage of Scripture actually does that. It's comparing our ability to give good gifts to God's giving good gifts. So any standard that falls under us being compared to God has to be evil, right? That's who we are. We're fallen, right? We're sinful, and we have 
remaining corruption in our hearts. So look at it again. It says, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly, will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? So here, it is stressing, and I'm highlighting the word good. And sometimes we miss that when we read a passage of Scripture like that. See, so recognize the evil, selfish nature of parents to love their children and only give them good gifts. Now, of course, this is stressed in the next verse number 9, 10, and 11, or verse 12 of actually another passage that's uh, relating to the same scripture, and it's this. If a son asks, notice what it says in verse number 9. Here's a human pa parent, all right? If a son asks, in verse 9, or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will he give him a stone? All right, now, of course, a round stone found in Israel by the seashore that really has an exact color and shape of loaves. Now, will a father, will a father mock his son's basic needs and give him something he could break his teeth on and will provide no nourishment to him? Of course, the answer to that question would have to be what? No. All right? He wouldn't do that. Evil parents wouldn't do that. Parents who, who are still have remaining sin wouldn't do that. All right? And then in verse number 10, it says this, or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? Of course, will a father give the son something forbidden by the law that will make him unclean and defiled before God? Of course, remember, serpents or eels were forbidden to be eaten. Leviticus chapter 11, verse number 12, whenever, whatever in the water does not have fins and scales is abhorrent to you. So in other words, he's relating to those who understand this from the Old Testament. So would a parent do this? The answer would be again, what? No. All right, and then turn over to Luke chapter 12, or Luke chapter 11 and verse number 12, because this really brings... Luke brings in another one, and he says this in Luke 11, verse number 12. Or if he asked for an egg, will he not give him a scorpion, will he? So that's what Luke says. So that's a third one that comes in here. And, of course, the answer, if a son asks for an egg, will the parent give him a scorpion? Now, when a scorpion rests, their claws and tail fold in and look like a pale egg. All right, so will the father deceive his son with a stinging scorpion that could cause serious harm and even death? Well, the answer to that is what? No, it's an emphatic no, right? So all these things is stressing that a parent would not give something evil or that is not good to their children, right? That's what is stressing here. So you see that even being evil, we know for the most part that not everything, yes, most things our children ask for will not be good for them. That is in their timing and manner in which they ask it. I remember when my son was just little, he wanted to get this knife. And he kept asking me, Dad, you know, for, for my birthday, that's what I want. I want that knife. I want that knife. And, uh, of course, Josh displaying his future in asking for that, being in the Marine Corps and stuff like that, and Special Forces. And so, of course, he wasn't ready for no knife, and so I didn't give it to him. So the next year comes by, what does he ask for, right? And then, of course, he decides to go out and get his own without asking me. So I confiscated that. And uh, matter of fact, I, I confiscated him and Andre. I confiscated many weapons. I used to wait at the door when he came home, you know? When he got older, I brought them all out. 
I gave some of them back, but I said, I really like this one. I'm keeping this one. <laughs> but uh, many years, he wasn't ready for, to handle a knife or to anything dangerous like that. So I didn't give it to him. And then, and finally, you know, finally I did get, give him something like that. Uh, but when he was ready for it and he was able to handle it. So see, uh, we know what to give to our children. But I want you to notice back in in our text, in verse 11 of chapter 7, notice this phrase, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give you good, what is good to those who ask him? See, that's very important. If we can do it, how, how about God who has no imperfections and is more ready to give what is good to to his children than even we are. So this is the lesser to the greater type of argument. The father is absolutely holy and good and without sin, but thanks to the Lord, the father is not going to grant you or I every desire and request when we ask it. The father will only, and I want to stress this, he will only grant what is good and what is right according to his wisdom and timing, because God only gives what is truly good for us. He only gives that, and that's what he gives all the time. See, we must remember that when we pray, and that's the point of this passage. That Listen, and here, of course, it, in that becomes an invitation. And here's the invitation right here. The invitation is this. Come with all the spontaneity of a child trying to please the Father and ask for whatever you want and expect that your wise and loving Father will give it to you if it is what? Good. All right. Oh, wait a minute. I didn't bank on that when I read that passage of Scripture. Maybe I missed that because... There's actually several pro problems that we have to kind of address when we consider this passage of Scripture. And, of course, the, the Scripture is that this, the Father who is in heaven give, gives what is good to those who ask him. All right? So there are several problems in view at this point. And here's the first problem right here. The first problem is this. If I ask it first in the form of a question, do we really ask for what is good for us when we become believers? See, we really don't ask for what is good for us. And why, why is that? Because we really don't know what's good for us at the time we're supposed to ask it. And so if we, when we become Christians and we're just babes in Christ, right? we don't know a whole lot of the Bible yet, we don't really know a whole lot of the, who the, what the character of God is yet, right? When, even when we grow in the Lord and we become what First John says, those young men who can take the Bible and, and fight the enemy with it, still we're, we're still at a, a bit of a disadvantage of understanding the nature of prayer. But then we would grow to become spiritual fathers or those who more are stable in, in the faith and live by faith, then we learn more of now what God wants us to ask. And so, see, you don't ask just for your daily needs only, do you? You usually ask for far more than what you need. You ask for riches and wealth. And if you don't get it, well, you always have a credit card that can purchase it for yourself. Then you will be in debt, which will bring more trouble and anxiety into your life. And see, so then having more than you need is not good for you. Too much will actually become a detriment to your development in Christ-likeness. So what are the things that are good for us to ask for? That would be the question, right? So then what are the good things? Well, at that point, we venture here into the believer's relationship to their heavenly father. And that relationship includes an active participation and acknowledgement of the father where 
in Matthew 5.20, for example, Christ has presented a standard of moral excellence to his children which is utterly unattainable by flesh and blood. Now, look what it says in a passage like this, and I'll just have it on the screen for now. It says, for I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, You have to ask, well, were the scribes and Pharisees, remember, they became the enemy of Christ. Were they righteous? Yes, they were in their living. But they were trying to obtain salvation by their righteousness. That was the wrong part. Right? We know we don't obtain salvation salvation by our righteousness. Righteousness is given to us after salvation. We receive the righteousness of Christ, right? And the Spirit of God we receive also that now teaches us how to live righteously. So, if believers are to have the power to live with a surpassing righteousness, like the restraint of evil words, corrupt wishes, impure desires, revengeful thoughts, the capacity to love one's enemy, and the blessing of those who despitefully use and persecute you, See, we'll have to learn what to ask in prayer then. Now, this next, this next uh, slide, I may call it, was one I, I used, uh, actually I developed many years ago, about what, what the Heavenly Father wants for you. Now, it's, it's kind of messy, but I'm going to explain it, all right? It's, it was an overhead that I did. Now, I don't know if you remember overhead projectors, all right? All right, that's a thing of the past, but... It was an overhead I did, so I kind of scanned it and used it. But I'm going to explain what I'm saying now. This is the Sermon on the Mount broken down. In the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord is really saying to his children, listen, this is the character and conduct you're supposed to have as one of my children. This is the influence I want you to have. This is the righteousness I want, you to, I want to see in your life. This is the piety that I want you to have. And this is the ambitions that I want you to have. So all those things are the things that we are actually to pray for. Now, what does the Father actually want? Well, he wants to give us good gifts, right? That's what he wants to do. But, see, he wants your character and conduct to be in line with his standard. He wants your influence to be salt and light in a dark world. He wants your righteousness, he wants your righteousness to be greater than the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. For the scripture I just put up there, for I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So in other words, Luke actually, the passage of scripture I mentioned is Luke, one thing he says that that he's not going to hold back giving the Holy Spirit of God to those who ask him. So those who become children of God receive the Spirit of God, right? But what does the Spirit of God do? The Spirit of God is given to us to make us holy, right? To make us righteous. To be able to put into practice what the Lord is talking about. Now, what does it mean to have a righteousness that is greater than those mentioned here in Scripture of the scribes who were the teachers of the law and the Pharisees who also were the teachers and the leaders of Israel concerning Scripture. They did live a righteous life as from a human perspective. So our righteousness has, righteousness has to look better than theirs. It has to look greater than theirs. What, what does that mean? Well, it is not just if I bring in the commandments. It's not, that, it's not just thou shalt commit adultery, thou shalt not commit adultery, but to preserve the sacredness and unity of the marriage bond by keeping what it pictures. And what does it picture? Christ's sacrifice and love for the church. It's not just thou shall not commit murder, but don't hate your neighbor. Love them by helping your neighbor keep alive and well. It's not just thou shall not steal. But help 
by protecting your neighbor's possession as if they were your own. It's not just, you shall not covet, but thank the Lord by rejoicing in the fact that maybe God has given someone else more than you. And God blessed them that way, and the Lord decided to do it like that. See, coveting means I want something that doesn't belong to me, that God hasn't given me, and maybe he'll never give it to me. So I'm rejoicing in the fact of those around me who have those things that I'll never have because God gave it to them. See, that's a, complete, that's a foreign way of thinking when it comes to the flesh. But when you're in the spirit, that's exactly what God wants to do. That's how our righteousness looks, righteousness looks greater than the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. And it's not just don't bear false witness, but it's by holding truth and integrity in high regard. That's what believers ought to do. So then one of the last things up here on our uh, slide is that of your piety. Your piety, your piety should be real by living in the presence of God and leaning on the provisions of God. God doesn't want hypocritical or mechanical worship. He wants real, genuine worship from your heart. In fact, if I take all what I just said and just look at another passage of Scripture that the Apostle Paul penned, it sounds like this. He says in Romans 13, verse 8 through 10, Oh, nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. If there is any other commandment, it's summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In verse 10, Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. So in Christ Jesus, we are actually can live in a way that is above the Ten Commandments. A righteousness that the Spirit of God produces in us, that is, is something that we cannot produce on our own. So you see that such demands for holiness and righteousness are beyond my feeble strength and your feeble strength. So we need help. We need God's grace to enable us to live up to that standard. Now, what, where can we get that help and grace? Where? Well, that's if we go back to our passage, we find this. This is where we get it. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. So what am I asking for? I'm asking for all the things in the Sermon on the Mount that I cannot produce on my own. I'm asking for a character and a conduct that is poor in spirit, who mourns, who is meek, who is somebody who lives according to righteousness, somebody who has influence in the world like salt and light. I'm praying for a righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. I'm praying that I wouldn't be hypocritical or mechanical in my worship, but I would be real before God, and I'm praying that my ambitions would be not for wealth that is incorrupt or that is corruptible, it would not be for the darkness of the world, but it would be for the light of God, and it would not be to serve money, but it would be to serve God. That's the things that you and I are to be praying for. And those are the good things that God's going to give us. When he, does, when he gives you, when you pray, he's going to give you those things. So sometimes we pray for things and we don't get it, but God gives you what you really need when you pray. But it's not what you ask for because we don't know what to ask right away. So eventually, as we grow in Christ, we will get to the point to know what to ask for, right? And so here in these passages, we have a soul cry for div divine assistance to be sought prayerfully and believingly and diligently and persistently. It is a prayer to the Heavenly Father 
by his children for the supply of grace to put into practice those precepts flesh and blood cannot accomplish. These are the good gifts the Heavenly Father wants to bestow upon his children. But these good gifts are the things we typically do not ask for. We usually ask for a stone, an eel, and a scorpion. That's what we usually ask for. And those things are none of those things are good for us. They're not beneficial to our spiritual life. They're not going to help us in any way. Actually, they're going to harm us. So see, God doesn't give you what you may think you need when you pray. He's going to give you what you really need. And so then you learn that, wow, my father really loves me because he didn't give me what I really asked for. See, so it's changing our thinking of who God is and what the whole deal about prayer is. So just ask your, your children what they want for breakfast and supper tonight and give them the independent, if, whatever you want, you could have. What are they going to ask for? Candy, ice cream, chips, cookies. Real beneficial, beneficial for their growth and health, right? And if they had that at every meal, well, that would, that would really be a problem. Now, you know I love desserts, right? And, uh, but if I had desserts three times a day, uh, I would end up spending a lot of time in, in the doctor's office because I, so I would be missing certain nutrients and vitamins and minerals because I'm not getting the full balanced diet that every one of us need to be healthy every day of our life. So again, going to our passage here in Matthew 7 verse 11, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him, stressing against that? Of course, that brings me to a second problem. And the second problem is this, that we are not convinced, some of us are not convinced as of yet, of God's goodness and love toward them. And you know what? Where does it show up? You know where it shows up? In your prayer life. Or let me say this, in your lack of prayer life. You know why? Because you have concluded in your mind, I prayed about this, all this, and nothing's happening, so I'm not going to pray about it anymore. And then before you know it, you're not praying about anything. So, 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 so some are not convinced of God's goodness and love toward them and that their prayer life definitely reveals this because when we ask for things that God does not seem to answer the way we desire he would answer them, we doubt his goodness and love toward us, don't we? Yes, we do. You know why? I've done it. Because I'm just like you. I have flesh and blood. I had to rest, wrestle through what it means to pray and what to pray for. So, so we do have prayer problems that we need to try to solve. And, of course, what is one of the first prayer problems? Well, the first one is this, a false picture of God, a false picture of God. And we, if we have a false picture of God, you know what happens? Prayer becomes unattractive. It becomes unattractive. See, we think that God needs to be told that we lack something. So we conclude that God is ignorant of me. Or we, we, we conclude that God needs to be bullied and begged into giving what we want, and so we conclude that God is reluctant towards me. Or we think that God can't be bothered by our petty affairs. God is busy enough for running the universe. I can't bring this little silly thing up to him, right? I'll just handle it myself. That's what I'll do. I'll handle it myself. I won't, I'll bother God for the big things, not the little things. So we, 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 we think that we can't, he, he can't be bothered by our petty affairs, so we conclude that God is distant and uncaring, don't we? Well, let me say this. God is neither distant, ignorant, reluctant, or uncaring, because I would violate a whole lot of Scripture if I were to conclude that. So either I'm believing a lie, or I have to believe the truth, right? And many times we do subtly believe what is false 
about who God is and how God does things, then we are to admit that we have been believing a lie. So, God is ready, the Bible says, to give you good gifts. He's ready to do that more than you're ready to give your own kids good gifts. So what's the problem? You know what the problem is? The problem is this. Are we ready to receive those good good gifts on his terms? That's the problem, right? Just like my son with that knife. He wasn't ready to receive on my timing and my terms when when I saw that he was ready as a parent. It's the same thing with us. God, uh, we have to be ready to receive God's good gifts on his terms. He's determining what is good for you, not you. Because let's face it, it doesn't matter how long you lived. It doesn't matter how much experience you have. When it comes to spiritual things, we really, really are just babies and still growing in our understanding and knowledge of what God is actually doing. And so our prayers can be actually reaching the Lord, because we know what we're praying for. Remember, prayer is not a carte blanche. We don't put it out there and just say, you know, Lord, I prayed about it, and so God has to do it. And of course, that's faith. No, that's not faith. That's not wisdom. That's just ignorance. We just don't know yet how to pray and what to ask for. Here's the second problem that we have when we come to prayer, a false picture of gifts. If we have a false picture of how God gives gifts, then, number one, we we believe prayer is unnecessary, right? Because if God is offering me for a gift and I can handle it myself, I don't need the gift, right? So I take care of it myself. See, lots of people get along without prayer by getting what they need by working for it. What they forget is that God gives creation gifts and he gives redemption gifts. What are the creation gifts he gives? He gives rain. He gives harvest. He gives what that produces, food. He gives you life every day. He gives life to people every day. He gives children. He gives family. He gives limited blessing to almost all creation. Now, if God were to remove that, where would we be? We would be in big trouble, right? In fact, we would be in more trouble today than they would be back then when they had farms and animals and could could provide a lot of their needs. Today, we go to the supermarket, right? And we go to the supermarket, we load up our basket, and we go home, we put it in our freezer and our, our refrigerator. But you know that if there's a crisis, and it's three days, go to the supermarket and get water, the, sh- the shelves and bread and eggs and the food, the shelves are empty, three days. We don't have a garden outside to be able to supply to our needs. We don't have chickens, some people have chickens, to be able to get the eggs and make uh, the eggs, I mean, make eggs, you know, and, and bacon and all that. We don't have that. If, if it's not there in the supermarket, that God provides the farmers to be able to get that food so it makes it easier for us to get, we would be in real big trouble. So see, the thing is that people don't realize how much they depend on creation gifts. If God withheld that, we would all die. But there's also redemption gifts that he gives, gives to his children. That's eternal salvation daily needs of both physical and spiritual things, deliverance from evil, increased knowledge, faith, hope, and love that comes from the Word of God. He gives us the Holy Spirit of God as not only someone who makes us holy, but as a down payment for redemption. In other words, he gives us to those things to say, listen, don't worry about your life. I've got all those things taken care of. Not only do I have your eternal salvation taken care of, I have your daily needs taken care of too. And so therefore, don't worry about those particular things. So the, Lord, the Lord's prayer, which these things come from, bring together both creation and redemption gifts. That's what God does. So the God the Father bestows common grace upon his whole creation, but he bestows special grace upon the Lord's 
the Lord Jesus' blood-bought children, like a passage of Scripture that I'm going to mention in 2 Peter when I get to it, where it says, seeing that his divine power has granted to every granted to us everything pertaining to what? Life and godliness, right? The physical part of life and also the spiritual part of life. And how does he do that? Through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. So, see, we have to have a correct understanding of gifts because, you know what? The gifts that God gives us are necessary. It's necessary for life both physical and spiritual life. If God were to hold, withhold those things, we would all be done. But there's another problem, and here's the third problem, a false picture of how prayer is answered. Now, I dealt with that a little bit here, but if we think that, if we have a false notion of how prayer is answered, then we will think that prayer is unproductive. Not only that a prayer is unattractive, prayer is unnecessary, but we'll also think that prayer is unproductive. It doesn't really, I prayed about it and nothing's happening. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Have you ever thought that? Sure you have. You have thought that because, said, Lord, I'm coming to you with the same prayer request and why aren't you answering me? Right? Why aren't you answering me? Well, Maybe because we have a false understanding of how prayer is actually answered. See, God, people may think God gives to people who don't ask. They didn't ask and they got it. Or God fails to give to many who do ask. I prayed to pass this exam but failed. I prayed to be healed of this illness but it got worse. I prayed... No one would die, and people die. So we conclude, well, prayer doesn't work, and then we don't pray. If God, if God was pledged to give whatever we ask, when we ask, in exactly the terms we ask, how could we bear that burden? If God gave you everything you want, how could you bear that? You, would, you and I would never be able to handle that. How then could God be God if he were subject to our whimsical prayers? We couldn't bear it, and he wouldn't be God. God would be to us just like rubbing a genie's lantern. You know, give me three wishes, right? And then, you, of course, you get which that's not how it is, even though we think about it like that. An unknown pastor, after many counseling sessions with individuals who were troubled because their prayers weren't being answered the way they hoped that they would be, came up with this helpful form formula, and I decided to think about it and use it because it is very helpful. And it's this. If the request is wrong... God says no. If the request is, if, if the request, in, if the timing is wrong, is wrong, God says slow. If you are wrong, God says grow. But if the request is right and the timing is right, and you are right, God says, go. It's not a bad way to understand what's going on when it comes to prayer. Because you know what? We have to mark this down. When we pray, no is an answer, right? My father, in his office, when uh, he had this sign that he gave, finally gave me because I wanted it, and the sign simply says this, what part of no don't you understand? Isn't that a good one? And I says, I, I need to have that. Because how many times parents, you say to your children, no, 
And it seems like they just really don't wrap their mind around those two little words, two, two little uh, uh, characters, right? And O, right? And you have to stress what it means to say no. And you know what? The Lord does use no because sometimes our prayers are inadequate and inappropriate. And so, therefore, we pray wrong no matter how sincere or how we make the request to the Lord, and so therefore our requests are actually misguided and our response to God would be no. Now, I'm, I don't have the time right now to, to look at all the passages, but I'm just going to mention some of them, all right? When did God say no to some of his disciples? Well, Peter, James, and John in, in Matthew chapter 17, this is the Mount of Transfiguration. Suddenly, God's glory descended upon Jesus, and Moses and Elijah appeared beside him, and Peter came up with this request to make three tabernacles, one for the Lord, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Possibly he did that because he desired to stay on the mountain and enjoy the the Lord's glory, right? But the Lord's response to him was, no, no. Why? Because a thick cloud enveloped them, cutting off all further communications, and Peter's request was wrong, and Jesus did not grant it. It was wrong. It was not the right time for him to do that, for for him to answer that prayer. And then you get James and John and, of course, their mother. James and John came along in Matthew chapter 20 with their mother, and what did they do? They asked if they could be Jesus' executive officers in his kingdom. Remember that request? That is to sit on his left and and his right in his kingdom. What does Jesus say to them? No. This is what it says in Scripture. It says, but Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? And they says, we are able. And he said to them, my cup you shall drink, but... To sit on my right and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. So James and John and their mother had a wrong request, and Jesus did not grant it to them. And then there's another one, and I want you to turn to this one. Look look at Luke, Luke chapter 9, verse number 51 to 56. This is again James and John. The disciples here were denied a travel permit through a Samaritan village, and James and John got really angry about it. All right, now, you may think, where did James and John get this idea that I'm going to read in the Scripture? Well, all you have to do is go back and read the life of Elijah, Elijah and Elisha, and you'll find out where they may have gotten this from, right? Now, let's what it's, look what it says in verse 51 of Luke chapter 9. It says, when the, day, when the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him, and they went and entered a, a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him, but they did not receive him because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they says, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Verse 55, but he turned and rebuked them and says, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them, and they went on to another village. So, Here, in this passage of Scripture, what does the Lord answer them? Their request is wrong, and of course, Jesus said, no. You you got it all wrong, guys. This is not the way we ought to be doing things. So the, the, the answers the Lord gives in each of these situations shows that the Lord God is too loving a father to grant requests that are totally self-serving Patently, materialistic, short-sighted, misinformed, and immature. He's not going to do that. Now, just imagine if the Lord granted this last request. 
people would be using prayer to, as a means of revenge. Lord, zap that person. Right? That's what they would be doing. Well, not that from time to time we wouldn't hope that prayer could be used that way. But it, it's not used that way. So motives play a large part to many of the things that we ask in prayer. According to the epistle of James, what we usually do is we do everything but pray. And when we do finally pray, we, it says we pray amiss, meaning that we, we pray with selfish, self-centered, uh, a self-centered heart, so our prayers sound like this. Lord, make me rich, make me famous, let me have a good time. Make all my dreams come true. Please give me a convenient, happy, satisfying, problem-free life. Isn't that the way we would pray? I mean, we probably have prayed in that way. But prayers like this smacks of a selfish heart and also worldliness. And that's, that's what James said in this passage of Scripture. Look at what James says there. It says, what is it? What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is, it, is not the source your pleasures, which wage war in your members? You lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot have obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, who, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. See, prayers that smack of this show a selfish, self-centered heart that is really more about what the world thinks than what God thinks and how God does things. And some prayers are offered to change other people. Lord, please change my husband, change my wife, change my boss, change my friend. Instead, it should be, Lord, let me learn how to pray for those who persecute me and share the gospel with them so they can be saved and see what I see. Some pray, Lord, let me win the lotto. That will answer all your, all your problems. Instead, how about praying, Lord, enable me to work so that I can eat and handle my finances so that I can give and trust you for the rest? Or some pray, Lord, give me a good grade, especially in school. Instead, see, God says sometimes we pray, give me a good grade when I haven't done the work to get the good grade, Right? I haven't read the material. I haven't really studied like I should. I've been partying and uh, not studying. See, instead of saying, Lord, give me a good grade, pray, Lord, enable me to be a, a harder worker and more disciplined student so that I can honestly obtain a good grade. So sometimes motives and reasons for our requests are not wrong but in the infinite mystery of the things of God, the outcome is sometimes no, and God never tells us why that happens. So when the Lord prayed for his disciples in the high priestly prayer in, in John chapter 17, where he prayed that all those who would hear them preach the word may come to him, this is what he, was going, he prayed for his disciples and, of course, for us, too. He prayed that his, his, for his disciples and not the world. Jesus prayed for them to be protected by the name of the Father. Jesus prayed to, that they would be unified as the Father, Son, and Spirit are unified. He prayed that they may have joy in full measure. He prayed that while they are in this hate-filled world, they would be protected by the influence of the evil one. He prayed that they would be set apart, what, by the truth of the word of God. He prayed for those who would yet believe by 
by the preaching of his own disciples, both present and future. He prayed, that means because we're saved today, the Lord's prayer was answered by us very being here as believers. He also prayed that his disciples would be with him to see his glory the, that he had before the foundation of the world. So now this is where Peter, James, and John would understand where God's going to show us his glory when we're with him in his presence. So the Lord prayed these things, and he prayed that the love of God would be evident in and around his disciples, and that love would be evident and seen by the world. That's what he prayed. And all those are within the framework of, the, of course, the will of God. And so our prayers need to be structured like that. And we have to examine how we pray. So from this day, from this day forward, brethren, there must be a radical change in what we believe about the Father in prayer and what we are to pray for. See, God will only give what is good to his children. Physically, he will give you daily food. He will give you daily clothing. He will give you daily shelter. He will give you opportunities for work. But he never promised to make you rich. He never promised to give you more than those things in Scripture. And of course, spiritually, conformity to the image of Jesus Christ, which is the will of God. And then from the Sermon on the Mount, the restraint of evil words, the cleansing of corrupt wishes, the removal of impure desires, the revengeful thoughts would be removed from us, and that we would love our neighbors and our enemies and bless those who despitefully use and persecute us. Those are the things that we ought to be persistent in when it comes to our prayers. So again, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? He will. So see, prayer, persistence in what God wants for you, that's what we're talking about today. So keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking for the good gifts God the Father has for all of his children. And he will give to you everything that you need to live in this world and to live the spiritual life in a way where your joy is maintained and the peace of God reigns in your heart and mind instead of worry. See, that's what he gives to his kids. And those are good things. Because what is the world seeking for anyway? Aren't they seeking for happiness? Well, how do you get that? You get that by living for God. That's how you get it. See, so God's answering the greatest prayer request of all. Lord, make me happy. Well, you're happy and blessed when you're following and obeying and loving the God who created you and who redeemed you in Christ Jesus. That's where you get your joy from. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, this morning I thank you once again for the incredible clarity of Scripture. Thank you, Lord, that it really turns over every stone for us. It helps us to see and evaluate ourselves as to where we are when it comes to our own prayer life. And so I pray, Lord, that from this day forward, we can adjust things so our prayers are in line with your will knowing that you will always give us what is good for us. And I pray, Lord, as we do seek you, I pray that we would never come to the place where we stop praying. If we do, we're not obeying you, we're obeying the enemy. And I just pray, Lord, as we do pray, that we would pray with a persistence and a fervency that never stops. Thank you, Lord, that you're going to answer our prayers ahead of time. You're going to answer those prayers that we offer up to you as far as our physical needs and our spiritual needs that you said you would answer and bless us with. Thank you for being our God and our Savior. We want to just cast our care upon you this morning. Guard our heart and mind, Lord, from 
worry so the peace of God could reign in our hearts. And Lord, let the joy of the Lord be our strength. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.